Hey everyone, welcome to the Youth Stuff Podcast. Today I am here with Melanie Doan. Melanie, long story, but she is a major figure in ukulele that isn't necessarily your mainstream performer, but in the world of education and other supporting roles. So just really briefly, she's had a career on Broadway. She's had a career as a private, uh, as, as, a, as a singer, as a headliner in like pop music. She has started an entire ukulele school in the Toronto area. And then on top of that, also uh, released an entire children's series called Ukulele U last year. So Melanie, welcome to the podcast. And is there anything else that I should add in that introduction? I don't even know all half of those things you're talking about. I'm uh, enjoying listening to the intro. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, it's great to have you. So, Melanie, you are the daughter of Jay Chalmers Doan, who is really seen by many people in the music education community as the father of modern ukulele education and influencing a number of other people, including um, you've got Peter Luongo out in British Columbia. You've got James and his whole method of everything that he does. You grew up with that. And as I look back at the calendar dates and everything, you would have been in his program. So can you describe what that was like as a kid growing up through that and how that led you into further music? Yeah, it was an incredible childhood. It was uh, the best thing you could ever wish for as a musical kid. Um, and I thought it was pretty normal and I took it for granted, of course. Um, but our, our, our family, I have an older sister and a younger brother. Um, we moved to Halifax. My dad got out of school at Boston University, came to Halifax as the new supervisor of music. We were babies. He implemented the program, which was free music for our whole city. So compulsory music from primary to 12 and continuing education for our whole city. Free, 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 free in the school board. Um, we thought this was what everyone got to have in their schools. Um, turns out that's not the case, especially nowadays. Um, but we grew up um playing with our peers at our school, um, getting choir at a young age, being in ukulele in, in grade four, string program. I'm a violinist as well. I got to be in an orchestra from grade four to 12, um, you know, pops orchestra, symphony orchestra, ukulele ensembles, um, making records and touring Canada and uh, performing for the queen or whoever should come to town. Um, all, all kinds of really neat things that I thought was normal. I, I thought it was very normal for, you know, to have people come from out of town who had nothing, you know, nothing was more exciting to them than talking about music education. And people were coming from all over the world to meet dad and to see this, this program in action. And I just thought, oh, well, you know, music education, it's at the center of the universe. Everyone cares about music. Everyone cares about kids and music. Um, you know, it was a little bit of a, a skewed uh, viewpoint, but um, it was a really nice way to grow up. And um, as it turns out, my my siblings and I all went into music. And so did many of my neighbors and friends that I grew up with because we loved it so much. And we had so much exposure and so much experience. By the time we got to grade 12, we were just, you know, raring to go. We were, some of us were already pros. We'd done so much with dad and with all the different pro, uh, music uh, groups we were in that we knew, we knew it's what we wanted to do. Um, that wasn't the point of the program to create professionals necessarily. It was, it was putting music in the hands of the people, which I think goes back to the origin of the instrument, you know, in the 1870, 89, 85. 85. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so when, when that was, you know, the, the, the beginnings of the, the turning of the machete into the, the ukulele and having it be part of the people's music, that is kind of the idea, right? That is why it's so beautiful and why it's so great for education. But, um, that is what I think um, if I want, if I were to speak for my dad, which I shouldn't do because he can do that himself, but he, you know, that, that was where he was coming from and um, I was the beneficiary. So it's pretty cool. So you started ukulele in fourth grade and you were doing general music probably up until that point. 
Did the ukulele continue throughout your high school years too? Did they have ukulele experiences in the high schools and so forth? Yeah, so you'd start in your school in grade four. I, I actually started at home because I was mm -hmm. playing already. But anyway, I, I kind of fast tracked, but in general, you would get to go at your school in grade four. In grade five, you'd go to the next level at your school, and then you'd audition for one of the B groups. And there was B1, B2, B3, B4, B5, and B6. And those were citywide. And you'd audition and get into one of those groups. And you were trying to get up. You know, Hopefully, you'd get up into B1. But I think uh, I got into B3 at the first time when I auditioned. And then I got into B2 the next year. And then I got into the B1. And then you're trying for the A group. So eventually you make your way, you claw your way up to the A group. And the A group was really the high school group who would tour Canada and would, you know, be on, you know, Anne Marie would call and we'd go perform with her or some, you know, these, these amazing um, opportunities would happen. And that's what the A group, oh, they're making a record. The A group's in the studio. You know, these were really big deal things or they'd be performing at whatever um, situation in the town. And, uh, you know, this was a really great way to keep us all inspired because we knew if we kept working at it and getting better and better, we had a goal. And, um, you know, I got, I got to be in that group for many years and travel. And I know that out West, this is what Peter Luongo's whole program was based on the same. I mean, he was working with teachers from Halifax who had moved to Langley. So my aunt Lorna was instrumental in uh, working with Peter and they had their own A group. And then their A group turned into really the, the Langley group, which is still going strong right you know today. And they play in Hawaii and tour all over and uh, they're amazing. So it's all, it's all this germ. And then of course, James grew up in that program out West. And many of my teachers who work with me here in Toronto, segueing into that, but I, I have a lot of teachers who uh, grew up all over Canada in my dad's program. <laughs> I never met them. They never met my dad, but they, they, you know, oh yeah, we know how to play yellow bird because we did it in grade four. These are, it, it was so, um, so, so much of a national program that these are some of the people that I've been able to work with now and work with kids in my, in my own program. And incidentally, you are, you have the Order of Canada, correct? Don't you have that? I do not. My dad has the Order of Canada, your which dad is has your Canada. A, a big honor uh, in recognizing his work in music education. So that is uh, that is his honor and uh, something we're, we're all proud. I got to be there when he received it. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, no, that's his uh, his big one. That's pretty cool. Did Now, so you were able to also do ukulele and violin all at the same time. At, oh, everyone was offered. Everyone was offered. So it, my dad's innovation really was that um, no one had put it in in a school setting at, to that point in a formalized way as a person who's part of the school board. So there was already a string program in place. Band. He's a he was a band and string player. Um, he was all about it. He wanted to build a symphony orchestra was the goal, which of course they did but within a couple of years that was uh, in place. But if all of the kids in grade four were learning this on their ukulele and they were learning harmony and they were learning rhythm, this whole routine, all three at once, right? right. my uh, little uh, two cents, but, you know, he <laughs> recognized, he was using the instrument um, mostly harmonically and singing and playing harmony. Um, and he realized that, why are we not doing the melody? Why are we not doing our harmony that we are doing on the other instruments? Plus we can do even more on this instrument. There's so much available to us like a piano and like a guitar, but this is costing at the time, you know, $7 an instrument. So he, he realized this was again, back to the Hawaiian um, origin of putting music in the hands of people, right? This is, he was like, this, this is accessibility. This is equity. This is getting it to everyone. Maybe people can't afford, you know, private lessons and this and that. This is about getting it to everyone. And when you start in grade four and you're already training your ears and you're starting to read a little and you can read a chart, 
when you get to grade five and start your string program, boy, are you ever good on your violin or cello? Boy, are you ever great when you're in the honor choir? You already can sing and tune. And that's what the ukulele uh, program was was really fostering was musical minds. And um, I, I know that it works because I do it with my students, but it, there's just nothing, uh, not, not a better delivery system for all that we want to deliver to, to create brains that are musical. Uh, they're already musical, but to organize it and to let really indicate to, to students, you have this in you, you get to own it, you get to explore it, you get to have it for your whole life, it's free. And you can write music, you can play with your friends, you can go in your room by yourself, you can do all the different things, whatever you choose, but it's yours to own, it's yours to have. And, and that's, you know, the message that that would start in grade four. And, you know, luckily in our town, we all got to do many, many things. But even with just uh, the chance to have this instrument in your life, it's a, it's a big, it's a big plus. Is that program still going in Nova Scotia where you grew up? No, not, not really. Not really. Okay. Right. Um, which is a sad, um, a sad thing in, in a way, um, of course, but it was also part of how school boards are at the moment. And, a, and, a, and that's another, we can go down that tangent at some other time. Um, it's not a priority. It's not a priority. Now, I also wanted to ask you, I have one of these, and if people don't know, I'm holding up a Northern, I think it was a JCD2, which is J. Chalmers Stone 2. It's a plywood uh, rectangular ukulele that were made in Japan that your dad um, basically helped design and, and import so that kids could play an affordable, good instrument um, in Canada. And my question was, did you grow up playing one of these, or did you have other ukuleles in your house? No, I played one of those. I practiced. I, I used to get um, all of the kids, all of us, we didn't get a, an allowance, but we got um, a cent a minute, I think, for practicing time. And I remember we say, we all were saving up to buy our new instruments because we had instruments, but then we wanted, my sister wanted a JCD4, which was more expensive. I was trying to get a JCD3, which is a little upgrade from the one you just showed. And um, before that, we were using Harmony Ukes, which um, were, were out of Chicago, if you know the Harmony ukulele um, company, uh, which had been going for many, many years. Um, but they had, I think it was a fire at a certain, I don't know what year, there was a fire in Chicago at this factory. And um, so the, the supply of instruments disappeared. And suddenly my dad was in a situation where he had, you know, 10,000 10, kids across the country that were needing instruments. And, and this was one of the ways they were meeting the demand. So my grandfather was part of this um, invention where they, they were trying to figure out how to um, make it affordable, which meant if they didn't have the bending, <laughs> bendy, bendy, <laughs> the curvy <laughs> curves, um, it was going to be something that they could figure out how to manufacture. And then Northern company uh, got involved, a Canadian company, and they um, they got it going, but uh, again, my dad will say, "Yeah, people thought I was really, you know, in it for some somehow in it for like a, a big money maker." <laughs> Which, of course, we all chuckle because we know the reality of that the situation was not that at all. But um, it was a success in that it got again it got music into the hands of kids, and a lot of us and we we did a lot of us in the Halifax program. Well, across Canada, played played the triangular ukes, and uh, and we loved them. They were great. I'm kind of surprised that they didn't make a comeback, you know, during that ukulele craze over the last 20 years since all those ukuleles hit. I thought maybe, you know, at some point someone would, because I don't think Northern as a company is around anymore. That Northern's not around. There were yeah. knockoffs. A lot of people have knocked them off for sure. They've just been copied. There's one called uh, Empire Music and is a Canadian company and they have a triangle. I think they still sell it. I'm not sure, but it's just, it's just a knockoff of okay. my dad's uh, design. It's not something that he's chased down his whole life. Oh, that's my design. He's not that person. He's, yeah. uh, you know, if you get into it with him, um, he'll just say, you know, it was it's never been about a money making situation for me. It's a, it's about, it's really pure, which is um, why he's so, such a great guy. 
So you grow up, you decide that you want to go into music education and you go to university. Yeah. And then while you're in university, you kind of have a left turn in your life a little bit, but it's a related left turn. What happens? Um, I I was at school and, and thinking, okay, yeah, I'm going to be a music teacher. I'm probably going to carry on my dad's legacy in some way. I, I don't know how this looks, but this seems obvious. You know, I like kids and I love music. Um, but after my second year, I did an audition for a show in town, <laughs> a show at the, at the, we have one professional theater in Halifax. So I auditioned I'm kind of on a whim. Some other friends were auditioning and I got a part in the show and I was so excited. Oh, I'm getting paid to be in a show. This is great. And I'd always loved doing theater as an amateur. Anyway, um, I decided to take the year off and go do the show and then I would come back and I would just keep practicing and I would still go to my teacher. I was a voice major. I didn't do violin in the end. I did voice and I just, I'll keep everything going and I'll, I'll go do the show and I'll just come back. Well, then I got offered a couple more shows. They offered me a few more that year. So then I was, did three shows and then they offered me the next year, a bunch more shows. And then I, you know, I was starting to look around at Toronto. I took a trip. Oh, maybe I'll go audition a little bit in Toronto. Anyway, soon, very soon, I was just, I guess I've moved to Toronto now. I guess I live here. And I was just um, doing, you know, attempting to make a living as as an artist and um, and really enjoying that journey, which is definitely, you know, you follow it as it takes you. It's a, it's a wave and it's a, it's a journey. And, a, and it was exciting for me. And I, I enjoyed that uh, new idea and eventually yeah, realized that we really not going back for a little while anyway. Now, what shows would you, were you in that people would recognize that while you were <laughs> either in Halifax or Toronto? Uh, well, um, eventually, I guess we, I did some things in, that people would have seen, but I was in, you know, regional theater. So that first show was Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. It was a professional production, but it was, uh, it was, it was really great. And I always loved that show. And then funny thing happened on the way to the forum. You know, these are all classics. Then I did, I got a, a straight role in Tartuffe and an adaptation of Tartuffe. So that was very interesting. And then I got a school tour going around to schools being, and it was a, an original production of some sort that we did. Um, but when I came to Toronto, I started working in, uh, got into some very, very cool Canadian plays. There was a show called Fire where I met a lot of, of my still my dear friends. I met my future husband in that show. It was a all about Jerry Lee. Lewis. It was based on the story of Jerry Lee Lewis and Jimmy Swaggart as in the in the play they're brothers and they they you know the rock and roll versus the evangelist and and it's all of that music. So it was beautiful. I was I got to play fiddle and I'm singing and I get to play bass and all the things. And I, you know, a lot of people, Denny Doherty was in that. So that's where I met Denny, who is, uh, people will know him from the Mamas and Papas. And he was doing a lot of theater too, also from Halifax. So that took me on a journey. Eventually, Denny had me on the road with, with something else as, as time went on. But um, I'm trying to think of other shows that you might know of. Eventually, the show that did go to Broadway was called The Buddy Holly Story. And that was something I did uh, it's many years ago, but um, was a, a great journey. We went to San Francisco first for a five week run and then we took it to Broadway, which it ran for a while. I didn't stay with the show. I gave my notice, if you can believe it, and went to do a show in Winnipeg. So I, you know, I was really on my own path and uh, trying to figure out what I was going to do and, and what was really serving me as an artist and all those things you do when you're in your 20s. So it was it was interesting times. Did the ukulele continue with you through all the time or did you kind of take a break from it in that little time period? It's just always with me. I mean, I always would I always would have my my uke and my violin. I just would take them everywhere with me. So if I was living in New York, I always had my violin. I always had my uke. Um, lots of times if I was in a show, suddenly I'm like, I'm playing the uke or I'm playing my fiddle. Like I, I was always, oh, well, we didn't know you play bass. Yeah, sure. I, I guess we could add that. In. You know, I was just always being roped into like, oh, once they realized I could, I was competent on these different things. It was always incorporated into shows, which was kind of funny. But um, I just would carry it with me. I was never teaching. I wasn't um, I wasn't thinking about, you know, how to build a program. None of that was on the radar. It was really about an artist's journey. And I was, I was uh, following that path. So when does the switch happen from being 
primarily an actress and a Broadway performer in musicals to a a career in pop music for a while. When does that switch happen in your life? Well, simultaneously, I would get hired. Um, different artists being in Toronto, um, I would get the call. Oh, we need a you know we need a bass player who can sing. Oh, okay, well, I'll come on the road on your tour. We need a fiddle player for this or that. So I was not only doing theater, but sometimes I would be working with musicians, other musicians, and I and I really enjoyed that too. It was I could see, oh, how how are they navigating this? So oh, Canada's a tricky spot. It's you know you got a lot of a lot of expensive touring, and oh, but there's a lot of beautiful festivals, and oh, these these are songwriters, and I really admire how they're you know navigating this. So I learned by working with others all about you know, when you're a songwriter, what the job is, you know, what, what's in, what, what, it's really all on your shoulders. And um, I liked that. I liked the idea of that. And I started to realize that it was great to support other songwriters, but eventually I wanted to step through and I realized I, I'm a songwriter. Hang on a second. I, I, I have songs. I want to, I think I'll support me now. So I stepped forward eventually. It took me a little while. And then I started to write and record, which was really fun. And I got uh, signed to um, Sony and uh, Columbia records and I made records for them for a few years and had a, had a really fun time in Canada and, some good radio success and, you know, a, a really a fun ride. I had a fun ride at a time when um, record company companies before the collapse, let's say, interestingly, uh, Napster was just starting when I sort of had the height of my radio uh, time, which really impacted the whole thing. You know, that was the beginning of the end, which was like, Oh, everyone can just get free music. <laughs> wow. That's <laughs> going to affect everybody, which it did. Every, everything kind of collapsed, um, but I was, I was able to, um, I experienced both sides of that, which was pretty cool to, to, to have been part of the, the time where it was a big machine. And then to also be at a time when it was, Oh, you have to do everything. You're going to do everything. <laughs> you need to know everything yourself now. Um, and, and I had to learn that and, and, you know, it's all, it's all empowering. It's all, it's all hard. It's uh, disappointments and all the, all the roller coaster ride. But, um, I feel very grateful that I was able to be part of both and I've seen both. So when you released your most recent single, which I think was last Christmas, <laughs> yeah. was last, did you do that yourself or do you still work through a publisher like Sony or Columbia or something like that? That's just self self published. And I just do my own thing at this point. Um, and I'm also really focused on working with kids in schools and as much as I love to perform and play and which I will, I'm sure do more of, but it's not easy to do both things. And, and I am, I'm happily focused on the job at hand, which um, is the, is the program and the schools. Yeah. So we can transition into that question. Um, we were talking right before we hit record today. And at, at some point you have a son and daughter and they start going to school and you see what they're experiencing in their school system and that leads you to make a major career change kind of in your life you want to talk about that yeah well it was gradual but i that's right i my kids were were getting into grade two and and three my elder one and um you know i just had it so good i had it so good and I just thought, what I what I've got to do something. I've got to do something. And even even just, you know, they're not even gonna play the ukulele. Like that that can't be that can't happen. Like they have to have at least, at least a uke program. So um I started to prepare for that. And um I was aiming for a grade four at their school. So they were they were younger. So I was sort of getting it ready as they were getting to grade four, I was getting ready to go and ask permission could i come in could i volunteer at the school would you permit me to come for 30 weeks and do a program this was the idea 30 weeks um at the end of the first year the beginner players they'll they'll be able to play and sing they'll be able to read a little they'll be starting to read they'll they'll be able to perform at, the, at a concert as a group and then they're going to move to the next level and i'll start another group this was the pitch um, of course, my dad was was coaching me and I said, OK, well, I'm ready. You know, I'm going to I'm going to have my meeting. Uh, the principal said I can come next week and chat. I think I'm ready. We went through all the points and he said, great. Yeah, you're you've got everything lined up. Good, good, good. 
one last question for you. <laughs> one last thing. Um, you are prepared to take these first 10 kids. You are prepared to take them right to grade 12, right? Says my dad. And I was like, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Good point, dad. And I had to, I, I, I knew in part of me knew that, but I hadn't really, you know, formally put that in my brain. So it was a very good wake up call that, you know, you don't start this thing and like, oh, okay, maybe I'll come back next year. Maybe I'll see how it goes. I'm here to go right through. We're going to do this and we're going to do it right. And I know how to do it because I was in it. I saw you, you taught me how to do it. So that's the way. Um, so that was a little bit of a shift. So by the time I went in for my eating, that that's where I was coming from. I didn't realize, you know, it was going to be these 10 kids. And I thought, yeah, by the next year, there will be two groups. What happened, what ended up happening is all the neighboring schools were saying, well, how do we get that? How, how come you're volunteering there? Why, why wouldn't you do it over here? I started to sort of, well, I guess I'm, I'm doing all the work anyway. I guess I could teach two classes a week. I guess I, you know, I'm already doing all the preparation. I may as well have these, you know, which snowballed pretty quick. Um, I started to rope in some of the kids, uh, the former kids that I grew up with who are now music teachers and professional musicians in Toronto and bring them as, in as teachers. And we started to have a little core group of teachers and it really started to expand. Um, so with those first, I think it was 10 kids mm -hmm. each week, we'll skip ahead. It's been 15 years now. Um, and we're, we're working with a thousand students each week. So it's definitely grown, <laughs> let's say. Did they have existing music programs or do they still have existing music programs in their schools as well? Like, you know, like elementary music ed with recorder and stuff and then into secondary or not? Some yes, some no. A lot, no. Most, no. And any that have, it's not a sure thing. It is It is under siege, let's say. It's, it's, um, it's a battle within the school board. It's a battle to keep it. That's another tangent, but these amazing music specialists who are very specialized people in, in what they do. I know some people do value them, but they're not valued in the way they should be. They're not recognized for their for their very specialized um, abilities and uh, expertise. So that at this point in the school board, for instance, here, I don't know what it's like where you are, um, and this is no fault of any teacher at all, but um, teachers are being tasked with the, being the music teacher, but they don't have to have any qualifications to be a music teacher, hmm. which to me is um, quite a shocker. And, and here in the States, you have to have specific licensure and, and so forth to, to teach, at least in most places. Well, so, my, yeah. what I'm what I'm saying is these are... You're a teacher in the school board, so you are you have qualifications as a teacher, right? Not as a music teacher. So as long as you're a teacher in the school board, you might be assigned to be the music teacher at the school. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> what I mean is, yeah, no music qualifications. Right, right. Yeah, here because, we have to have specific. Yeah, and to me, that is a reflection of what what how that is valued. Oh well. Oh, they, they seem to like music. Well, you could teach the music in the school. Well, maybe. You might get lucky. It might go well. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. You, you started off this program then as a volunteer. Were you still, at that point, keeping your performing career going and then just volunteering when you had time on the side? And when did that complete switch come <laughs> over where the, the teaching became actually the program became more than everything else. Yeah, it was gradual. And, you know, I still work. Um, I still do things, um, other things, but I'm not, um, I'm not looking for those other things in the same way that I used to as an artist, full-time artist. So um, it, it happened gradually. And really in, in, in the moment where I was training more teachers, sort of midpoint, maybe eight years ago, I did a very, very, um, particular uh, searching for teachers and teacher training. I did a, a like a 10 week intense teacher training program where I was like, I have to get another six, seven, eight, eight teachers. teachers 
right now because we can't meet the demand. We are turning, we're tur I'm turning down kids and, and, and neighborhoods um, and we just need more teachers and we can reach more kids. And so that was, that, that became, and, and then to be able to pay all of the teachers and all of the things that were involved, we ended up, uh, we needed to become a charitable organization so that I could raise the money to, to be able to offer it because again, my model is it's free for everyone, right? This is where I'm coming from at all times. It's free. It's free for everyone. Well, my dad was in the school board, so that, that meant the school board was was part of making it free for everyone. I'm not in the school board, so I'm I've had to figure out a different way to fund it. But um, the gap and the void are for real. There's there are no music teachers, there are no music programs. And what's really sad is when there is a music teacher or a program because of the way the school boards are set up. And again, it's a, it's a bigger problem and I'm not, I'm not faulting anyone at the moment. I think it's just where we are at this moment in time, but willy nilly, a teacher will just be, Oh, well, you're now at this school. Oh, now you're going to be across town at this school or you're, you're going to be over here. Well, if you're building a music program and you know, this, it's not a thing where one year it's all okay there. It's all in place. We have an orchestra. It doesn't work like that. It is a commitment for a long term, and then you will have musicians. Um, these poor teachers who are building programs, it could be dismantled at any time. And then there's instruments sitting there, no one's using. It's just, um, you know, it's a heartbreaker. I needed to figure out a way to be able to implement a program where I could have the consistency, I can take them to grade 12. Like that was the directive. Was the directive. Like, That's directive. Are you taking them to grade 12? Yes, I can take them to grade 12 because no one can move me around. We're not part of the school board. But does the school board partner with me because they see the value and they are they are like a partner in that I'm allowed to go into school settings? Yes. Am I allowed to work um, in their buildings and, and get permits? Yes. So that's the way we've maneuvered it. And it, and it works very, very well. Um, is it perfect? I don't think it's perfect. Is the school board functioning well at the moment? Not great. I'm, I'm sad to say that, but it's not great. And I don't know how to fix that exactly, but I do know how to do this. So that's been my mission, I guess. Unless you run for the school board, right? That's the other. <laughs> no, but I do. Yeah. And I, I shouldn't do that. That, that would be not a good use of my, my abilities. Um, it's, it's much, it's beyond me how to fix that. That's not my expertise. So right. no, I wouldn't even suggest that because that's, I'm not going to be the one to fix it. Um, I want to be solution, obviously. And um, again, I don't, I don't, um, I'm not down on anyone who is in that system. There are ways we can work with it, but I do think it's got to be built back up. And I think the respect for music and musicians and what it is to be an artist at all is not well understood. And that's, that's lack of, lack of understanding, but lack of general knowledge about artists and music. It's just people don't know anymore what it takes. They just don't know. I'll ask you some nuts and bolts questions too. So um, when you're starting your program, you base it upon what your dad did mm -hmm. um, and use his system. But did you also like look at what he and James had put together? You know, cause I know that James and he had yeah. worked to put, is that the basis or did you take what was there and then make your own yet system you know what I'm saying? Did you make your own hybrid of that? What what approach did you take? It's all of those things. It's my dad's method. So then, and James uh, adapted and they relaunched their edition of it, the books and everything. So that's the curriculum. And um, the adaptation comes in where we are doing 30 weeks. So we're really from you know, October, we start in October, go till the beginning of June. And over those 30 weeks, 10 week, three, 10 week periods of time, we have an arc of what, what each group is uh, going to achieve by the end of those 10 weeks. Then it's the next 10 weeks, the next 10 weeks. And it, and it all is um, melody, harmony, and rhythm. So right away we're doing open strings, eight on each, you know, they're learning to hold their instrument and they're learning to play their open strings first day. And then we're getting fingers on frets. And um, as my dad and I have been working on chromatic scale right away, because one of the advantages of this instrument, unlike or for recorder, and I mean, we, we can do all chromatics 
and you can see them, you can hear them, you can understand them so well. So we do that a pentatonic scale right away. Um, we're um, then right into a major scale, into our modes. These are warm ups, and then we um, we'll do echo picking, which is again a James and a Dad fit. Excuse me, and then it's our courting and working on arrangements that reinforce all of that. Um, whatever skill we're we're in the midst of elevating, it's going to be um, accentuated in that repertoire. So whatever tune it is, um, it's going to be. Oh, now we're in the key of A and we're doing this song, and then it's going to have a little picking solo, and then there might be an improvisation solo thing where everyone takes a takes a solo, and then we're back and the end but every every piece is curated so that it's you know an uplifting great song for kids in a key that we want to be able to sing well to be able to um do ear work harmony melody rhythm and 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 improvisation as often as possible so touching on all of those things and that goes back to to dad and the big one of his, when, when I'm working with my teachers, is um, our one of our prime directives, if you want to Star Trek it. Um, <laughs> you know, when you're teaching, and sometimes we have very short classes, you might be uh, permitted to go in for half an hour, or you've got 40 minutes, and it's lunch hour, and you then you have to get the chairs and pack up and be out of there. Um, you need to be playing 99% of the time. So teaching my, my teachers um, know how to Okay, introduction everyone, get ready to play. Let's do a D scale, and we're gonna do eight times on each. And when you get to the F sharp string, you're gonna just do eliminator. So we're gonna play eliminator game, eliminate F sharp. Here we go, a one, two, ready, play. D, 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 second finger. Okay, open string. And then you're walking up the scale and the teacher's always accompanying and keeping everything moving. When we get to the end of the scale, two on each, ready and play. And then we're just like, like at a sports um, rehearsal or practice, uh, we're not sort of, now what we're gonna do everyone it's not that. It's like, okay, four times around the field. And when you get back, I want 10 push-ups. Okay. And then we're going to run our drills. And then we're going to do this because we only have this much time. And that's my dad. That's my dad. If you're talking about the music, you're not doing your job. You're playing. You can give direction while we're playing. You can, you know, keep everything under control, obviously, but you're playing the whole time if possible. So that's always our goal is play, 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 play the end. And um, that keeps everyone very busy. That keeps everyone's attention. And that makes my teachers um, have a hard job. They've got to be on, on their game. And I usually say, if you're not sweating through your shirt, they probably you probably weren't, <laughs> weren't succeeding. That's how hard it is. But it's so, so uh, rewarding. So hopefully you're sweating through your shirt, but with a smile on your face. So that's why oh, I love. Doing. There's a lot there that I really love. By the way, I'm going to bring up this too. If you're watching or if you're listening to the, I just brought up the website for donemusicschool.ca and I'll leave that on for a while here as, as we're talking. Um, now that you you hit a major point of finding keys that are good for kids to sing in because that perhaps is one of the most dangerous parts of uh, GCEA tuned ukulele or open you know C tuning um, is like, for example, happy birthday is awful in the key of C, just an awful, key for that kids generally sing better in the keys of f and g than they do in the key of c now there are exceptions right depending on the song y your dad long ago moved to d6 tuning for for his approach i know james uses it and what he does i know they use it peter's program which his son is now running out in british columbia they all use it um, what are your thoughts about the D6 tuning? And then perhaps if you ever talk with Americans who don't use it or people from Europe that don't use it. Well, dad didn't really move to it. It was already, it already existed. It's just that the internet um, at what, at when it was came into existence, um, there were both tunings were in existence and um, someone didn't know that the D was also happening and they got on the internet and, and went went to town with it. But it wasn't that dad came up with the detuning. It was, I have, I don't have a picture of it here, but um, the Harmony Ukes, Harmony um, out of Chicago, they used to have written on them ADF sharp B on the Ukes. That was the tuning. Um, wasn't anything my dad made up. What my dad came up with um, 
which he, um, you know, was was really thinking about teaching and what, what he could get out of this situation as much learning as possible was to lower the fourth string, mm -hmm. which you can do in any, you know, in C or D, it doesn't matter. You can lower it. It works better in D because we're a little bit higher. So um, what he did is lower this fourth string. So we have more range. And when you're reading off the page, you're not suddenly at the, every time you get to a D note, you're jumping up the octave on the scale to read notes. This meant we could pick any piece of music already written. It would, you didn't need to go buy ukulele music. You could buy any music and you'd have a low, the low string would mean linear tuning. Um, this was a breakthrough as a teacher and what what is um, to me fundamental about the method, and it doesn't it has nothing to do with D or C tuning. It, I, I would just say if if you're teaching this instrument, drop your fourth string so that you can teach all of the scales. So you can also have these bass lines. All about it just opens up the range and you have so much more that you can do with your students. Um, so much of the repertoire we do utilizes that low string. And um, it doesn't mean that the other tuning isn't amazing and you can do it. It's really going to be more of a, I don't have my other tuning right here, but I have lots of ukuleles and I keep them in all the tunings. And some people are in G because they like to play their baritones that's all great. I play, I have violins in different keys and we all know in a band, we've got E flat, B flat, A, C, all the different tunings. It does, none of that really matters. Um, musicians don't care about this stuff. <laughs> We're, we don't care. It's just music, right? Um, it has become a kind of a sticking point for people if they it's get, you know, right. thinking, oh no, well, I can't, I couldn't possibly think about that. Well, it's really not that difficult. And um, I just say to teachers, if you're really going to go for this and do a program, and lots of people aren't going to, it's a lot of work, but anyone who's really serious about it, consider this because it's going to make your job easier. You're going to be able to deliver more music to your students and you're going to be doing them a service as musicians. I sometimes have been thinking about like ukulele for musicians. It might be different than ukulele for enthusiasts. Do you know what I mean? When you're thinking like a musician, that doesn't matter. Um, and, and I love to be able to tell our students, you don't need to go buy ukulele books. Buy a book that you like the tunes that are in there. You can read, you know chords. You can read any chords that you know. You can read melody lines. You know how to read. Just get, you can get a flute book and play. It's in, it's got beautiful melodies for you. Anything for violin, you can play it. Anything for guitar, you know those chords. And those will mostly be in G, D, A, and E, by the way, because all string players as a violinist, I know, we also use the bass for a lot of our students. And that is open string bass, D, key of D, A and G. So that that is another reason why this key works for us. But again, my dad didn't do this. Um, he he had the pleasure of working with Herb Ota, who is, you know, the foremost virtuoso of Hawaii. And Herb Ota played in the key of D. Herb Ota liked the key of D. It's brighter. The musicians like the key of D. So um, it wasn't that he came thought, oh, I'm going to tell everyone what key to play in. It was already happening. Um, we have this really great thing that might show you. This, this is directly from Herb Ota, complete ukulele chord chart that we use with our senior students. This has every chord, every seven chord. It's pages and pages of these beautiful chords. So every jazz piece you've ever wanted to play. And that's hard to find on, on ukulele because um, there are so many inversions going on, right? So when you're looking for your bass note and what shape will I choose? Herbota. Thank you, Herbota. Um, Otasan. Anyway, um, that's just a little bit about that detuning. It's sort of, it doesn't matter, right? It, it doesn't matter. What I think matters is the low string so that you can play an A scale or a G scale, depending what you're in. You can um, go up and down when you're reading, learning to read and not have to jump an octave for some reason because you've got a high string on there. Doesn't mean you don't later use a high string because you love the sound. Of course you do. You have all the, everything is available, right? Um, it's a learning tool. So that's the tangent, the tuning tangent.
No, it's a great, it's a great discussion to have. And it's just good to have that perspective. I, I appreciate you sharing that with us because that's, that's good. Now, I, I also want to ask you, your own kids went through your program then. Yeah. How did they respond and what are they doing with it now? Uh, they loved, they were like me. Um, they loved it and they, they were doing it with their friends, which is why I always liked it. I love, I loved music, but I loved doing music with my friends. And that is also a really a key thing in how we operate our program now, because um, that is a, one of the joys in life is to play music with your friends. You know, it's great to play it by yourself. I love that too, but being with your friends and playing music, it's pretty great. Um, so they did enjoy that. Um, and they went right through my program and one of them's now at music school. He's uh, he also plays a beautiful piano and he's, he's going through as a drummer at Humber college here in Toronto and uh, playing with various recording artists and being a musician. So I'm very proud of him. And my daughter is the younger one. So she was l even littler going through. And she uh, she now teaches for me on her, in, if she can ever have spare time. And uh, she's also a pro. She's a singer and songwriter. She plays her uke all day long and uh, writes a lot of music. And um, she's also a writer. Um, for television. So she's been doing that. That's her kind of her job, but they both are doing music and uh, I'm really, really proud of how they've, they just still play. They play all the time. They, it's just part of their, of their life. It's a, it's a tool also for their, for their music making. Um, and I'm, that's just, that was the point. There's a little clip and I can, I can send it to you later, but um, it's on our website where um, when they were just little and in the program, I did an interview and they, I wanted to bring a whole bunch of kids onto this show and they didn't have room. And they were like, no, we can't bring your whole, you know, 25 kids or whoever, however many I said. And I said, well, I guess I could bring my, I'll bring my two kids. And then you can see a little bit of what we do. So we did a little interview and I was, you know, I, I look at it every so often and we have it posted there, but I'm really glad I did that because it's the only place I have a, a documentation of them doing a little bit of it with me when they were little and um, people can go take a look, but they're, they're just, um, they're doing it just, just like any other kid that was, that was in my program. They, they also did it, but that was what I experienced. I had to go audition and my dad was the guy you auditioned for to get into the A group. And I was nervous like all the other kids. And, you know, I didn't know if I would get in and all that stuff. And um, it worked. We had kind of like, I knew that that was professional. That's my dad. He's the teacher. And then my dad is his dad at home. It's different. Um, and my kids understood all of that and, and got the benefit of being in the program in, in a great way. So it worked out. I was going to ask, did your nephews and nieces also go into music with the influence of your, your own dad spreading down into your brother and sister? Yeah, well, my sister is a music teacher in Cape Breton, and that's a good couple thousand miles away. So we're not we're not in the same. But she teaches for me now. Um, we have a pilot program in Nova Scotia, so now I'm lucky enough to have her working with me, and I'm very glad. And her kids are all professionals. One's a dance professional dancer, one runs a theater, and one is a, a singer and songwriter. So yeah, they all follow. And then my brother's got a seven year old, and she's in my program here in Toronto. Well, so fantastic. yeah it's um, pretty great now the scope of your program you i think you said you have about a thousand students in how many different schools that participate in toronto well it's a it's a big city as you know um and we we kind of it, the, the uh the general uh we're scattered from city the you know east to west um in 59 weekly classes i think it is so uh, we're very far west and we're, we're sporadically through the city and over to the east in many, many school buildings. So what we do is permit in neighborhoods and why we love to be in school buildings is because they're, they're great buildings. They're not, they're underused and um, we're in kids' neighborhoods. So we're really trying to reduce barriers of, of transportation. Families who have two parents working are not families who are able to join music and go get private lessons and go downtown to wherever to be part of an orchestra or something, you know, it's too expensive and no one's, no one's around to drive their kids around for that stuff. These are, these are neighborhoods and families we really want to reach because we'll, we'll come to the neighborhood. We're at your neighborhood after school. You're going to pick everyone up at 
4.30 or 5 and they've had their lesson already or we're at lunch hour at the school. So that's really our goal is to um, reduce those barriers. And again, of course, this is a barrier reducer because can afford the instrument and um, our students, all of our registered students own their instruments. So whether they are able to purchase it themselves, sometimes yes, sometimes no, we make sure that they own it. So everyone owns their instrument, which means they can practice. They can just love and hold it and they know it's theirs. They can decorate it, whatever they want to do, it's theirs. And they, they taking ownership of your instrument makes a big difference when you're practicing, when you're, um, seeing your future in music. If it's yours, it's yours. And that is part of how we do it. And uh, it does make a difference. But that, again, is ukulele is, um, is a barrier breaker. You can't, you can't afford that with, with other, I mean, I love these other, I love the piano. <laughs> I love guitar. I love violin, but a really bad, cheap violin is still 500 bucks. It's a lot of money. I do want all my students to get to play all the instruments and some of them will get that opportunity, but some of them may never get any other opportunity, but this to, to learn an instrument. This may be their one chance to know how musical they are, to know that they, they are an artist. They may not get that chance unless we do this. And um, that is a real motivating force for us. I keep noticing your Maya Moe right there that you keep showing. Do you want to share anything about your Maya Moe? I love it. Um, <laughs> had it for a while. Um, until I had this, uh, I've had it maybe 10 years now. Um, I was still playing my grade eight uke, which was my JCD three. Um, my students loved it because it was a triangle. It was cool. Um, but it is a student instrument and um, it was, it needed a lot of work. My dad ended up uh, gifting each of us a new my Moe uke and uh, I was so I don't know why I wouldn't have I, I didn't take the leap I just oh well, I could never spend that money on on myself or something ridiculous like spend the money get yourself a beautiful instrument anyway if if you're hesitant anyone out there get get yourself a beautiful instrument um, it's changed my life and I love I use it in the studio I used it on the tv show of course and um, I use it people call me for for sessions all the time and I have a few different tunings I like to use, but this one's my D, my D tuned low, low fourth string. And uh, it's beautiful. Mango, very beautiful. Um, if people want to support what you're doing, I imagine they can go to the Doan Music School website and look at how to support the program. Absolutely. We would love that. If people are interested in perhaps becoming an instructor or something that maybe live in Toronto, should anyone listen or watch this podcast? How would they go about becoming a authorized instructor for Doan Music School? Or if they wanted to start a Doan Music School in their own school district, how would they go about that? Um, I do support a lot of teachers who are starting programs, and I love to do that. Um, just contact me. Everyone's situation is a little different, so there's no, um, there's no course that just fits anyone's bill. Um, I have teachers who are professional theater people who have learned to play the ukulele because they are great classroom teachers and they're performers and they know how to run a show, but they never played the uke before. And, and they are some of my top teachers. I've got amazing musicians who are like, really kids, what do I do? You know, there's all of the different people have a different background. And um, if you're meant to do it and you want to do it, it's hard work and it, you're not going to get in it for the money. But if you're if you're serious, I will I would love to have you with me and I will train you up and get you on your feet. So contact me if you're if you're interested. Um, again, I kind of my dad always had a another. He's got many sayings. James is better at remembering all of my dad's sayings than I am. So luckily, James remembers. But um, he used to talk about passing the interest test. He talks about that a lot with students, with teachers, with everybody. But um, with pr prospective teachers, um, you really have to pass the interest test. It's not it's not an easy job. Like I said, if you're not sweating through your shirt at the end of class, you probably probably lost your class. You know, something went wrong. Um, it's really hard work. Kids are hard. Uh, it's a hard go. It's it's hard to work in schools with kids. There's a lot of factors. Um, and it, it's just so rewarding and so exciting to bring music to kids. So if that's really where you're coming from, you don't mind that you have to maybe carry the chairs from the other room and set up the room and then put them back afterwards. These are things we do because we care a lot. Um, but it's not for everyone. 
and and that's cool. That's okay. It isn't supposed to be for everyone, but if it is for you, um, I'd love to hear from you and I'd love to um, come and come and see a class. That's a first step. Pass the interest test. Come and see what you what you think. Come and join my adult group. I have a very um, advanced adult group that is for my teachers so that their playing is always ahead of the kids. I want them to always be steps, way steps ahead of their kids. Um, and our kids are good. We have kids, you know, they're in high school. They're, they can play. So we need to be well ahead of them. Um, but, you know, that's a good place where a lot of uh, prospective teachers come and join that group and they get their feet wet and say, okay, yeah, I need to learn how to read on this instrument. I'm a really good trumpet player, but I don't know how to read on this string instrument. So there's a lot of steps depending on your background, what you might want to look at, and then we'll get you on your feet. How many kids other than your daughter have come back to become part of the teaching program? Quite a few. I mean, the first years, those kids are just graduating and maybe they're in the middle of university. My first class graduated last year from university. Some have come back to my adult group and a couple have been volunteering just when they can. Of course, they're busy. These are kids that are like looking for full-time work and they're doing this and that, but some of them are like, I'm between jobs. Can I volunteer? Do you need a helper? So that is really amazing to see them coming back. A few will come back at concerts and join in. Oh, do you need someone to come and tune tune ukes? And then I'll sing in the back row and I'll join in at the concert or whatever it may be. so that was like, I think I had, what, 10 kids. So that's my first 10 who have graduated university and are sort of trickling back to me. It's pretty cool. How did you weather the pandemic or the shutdowns? How did that go? It went really well, um, but we did a lot of new things that we didn't ever expect to do. We learned how to teach on Zoom, which you'd think is terrible, and it isn't anyone's favorite, that's for sure. But um We brought everyone to Zoom. At times we had classes, four pages of Zoom kids in some of our classes, um, which is a lot of kids. We would have, you come come to class and we have teachers, like six teachers ready in breakout rooms to go to. So what you do is bring your uke, come a little early and the teacher Mm -hmm. takes you through. Mm -hmm. One at a time you'd unmute and and the kids would have to turn their pegs, which isn't how we normally do it. In class, the teacher tunes up quick and off we go. So what, there were some benefits. They really learned about their, hmm, the kids that were, you know, everyone's got different um, quickness with their ears. We all have different levels of development, but um, the kids who were like really tuning in to like, (laughs) oh, we would just say, yeah, yeah, stop a little bit more. Okay. And freeze. And we would just be doing it uh, with our ears over the zoom. That was just the tuning and which turned into a whole thing itself because they were really learning a lot about up and down and where, why is it in tune and how, how do you know? I hear it. You hear it. How can you hear it? You know, and, and we just would just, Oh, this is just how we do it. And they learned about that. And then we'd go to class and um, we developed a thing. We did a thing called U school ukulele school TV, which we put at the end of every zoom class to give the kids. Cause we knew, Oh, zoom is, they're so tired of it. And our teachers tired. So uh, my brother and I made an episode every week, for th- we have two seasons 30 weeks times two so 60 episodes of U school tv that we produced and we put it on at the end of every zoom class for the kids which was me hey and then i'd have special guests or james might say hi or i'd let's go into the vault and we'd show the kids and then they started to produce send me whatever they were doing at home and we'd feature the kids people can go see this at our website it's all up there it turned into this such an amazing learning experience for, you know, not only were they, oh, when do we, do we have youth school TV today? Yeah, but we're just going to do one more pass at this song we're working on. And then we'll, then we have youth school TV, everyone. And they would wait for it. They'd wait for it. And then we'd have the show and then they'd send in their stuff. And so then they became part of the show. And uh, that was all because of the pandemic, which, you know, it was a gift and it was a lot of hard work and all those things. But it turned out our pandemic babies, as we call them, they are now moving in. We have a, a before the A group is our B1 group. They're almost all of those pandemic kids are our B group right now. And they're so good. We're like, oh, my gosh, that was a bonus. Somehow that cohort got some extra one-on-one a little bit or something. They got a little something extra that turned into a benefit and they're amazing players. So, you know, 
you never know. It worked out. That's very cool. The The other thing I should ask you about um, doing music school before we move to just talking quickly about uh, Ukulele U is you have these unbelievable collaborations with major Canadian artists. And the one that comes to my mind right away is Bare Naked Ladies because I grew up, you know, knowing if I had a million dollars, right? And also their version of, I think it's God Rest You Merry Gentlemen, I think oh, is one of my all time favorites, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, was that just your connections as a solo artist leading into this, or did those come about another way? I've no. I, I worked with them years ago. Um, I was playing uh, in the Yukon. Actually, we were at a festival, and and they had just uh, started. They were just becoming a big deal. It was the very beginning of their career. So we've known each other a long, long, long time, um, and have just been friends and. Um, when things started to really take off with the program, um, they knew what I was doing. And um, Jim in particular, the bass player, does a lot of volunteer work in schools. And he brought me to his own kids' school and we started a program there. And um, he wanted to get involved with something. And I said, well, you know, this would be uh, the biggest help would be let's do a song. And he 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 was really the helper. But all, all of the guys are friends. Ed's an old friend and all of them have been amazing and huge support. So that was the first one with the idea that we do one almost every year if we can. We don't always do one every year, but we, we are aiming for that. Um, and then Jan Arden, I don't know if you know Jan, but she's a humongous star here in Canada. And Jan is an old friend. I toured with Jan um, years ago and we've always remained friends and she's she's she came on board to do try a little kindness which has been a, a big boost for the program too and then last year we had molly johnson who's a jazz um icon here and in paris and around the world and she did uh, ooh child with us last year and you can see i think all those are on youtube if you want to watch the videos in fact yeah, you can like go to spotify if you want to add us to your playlist they're pretty uplifting beautiful recordings if you ever get a chance you should reach out to michael buble that would be something too that would be another canadian artist there <laughs> we, we like him right on the list hey michael let's do it i've got a couple tunes in mind so at some point something happens here where you get this idea and along I think your brother was working with you as well as somebody else that you had known who was a producer and you decide we would really like to put together something to uplift families and bring music in the lives of families with this short form tv show how does that happen and where does that stand because I I'm I'm curious that there's gonna be a season two of ukulele so you want to talk about that yeah, well, yeah. it's on the air here in Canada on CBC, so that's you know a dream come true for me. I grew up watching CBC every morning, and Mr. Dress Up, you don't know who that is, but a little bit like Mr. Rogers um, and other classics. That uh, so it's a it's a very coveted um, and you know respected place for kids, a safe place for kids, and our program is there every morning right now, which is really a joy for me. Um, it wasn't even, I, I ended up being a creator of the program and an executive producer of the show and wrote the music, as you mentioned, with my brother. Um, but it was a, it was the brainchild of uh, producer Bob Ezrin, who you may know of from such things as um, The Wall and other huge, huge hits. He's a, uh, he's big time, amazing Canadian, great guy. Um, approached me about, um, he had the idea for a show. Um, ukulele U is how he pronounced it, and that's okay. Um, and Ukulele U or Ukulele U, um, he wanted me to come a partner with him to create the show. And he had heard of the work I was doing in schools and wanted to um, see if I would be involved to create it and to probably host, be on the show and host it with, uh, with a number of kids. And we started working on it a few years ago and um, through the pandemic and all the ups and downs and eventually got it produced um, in, in isolation with kids, which was a huge obstacle of, of many, many kinds. Uh, but we got it made and our cast is beautiful and the kids are great and I'm really proud of the music. And the, the idea really is, is, a, is an inclusive, safe place for kids to be together, to sing together. We sing live on the show. I play my, my uke the whole time. And the kids are learning. It's 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 not an instructional how to play an instrument 
that when when that was even brought up at all, I said, listen, guys, it's got to be a singing show because you can't teach that over the airwaves in two minutes. That's just not, that's not, I, I, not in good conscience, that can't happen. <laughs> like that is not something you should advertise. What it has to be is music, which starts here and here. When we're young, we if we're singing and we're, our brains are ready for music, we can do it all. And that's where we should be starting from that. But, but with this beautiful, you know, facilitator. So the uke was the facilitation of the music and these kids sing with me and it's, it's really, really fun. And yes, I would love another, another uh, season right now. We've made 52 seasons. It's a lot. I've had not seasons, 52 episodes. So they have a lot that they should, you know, they show one of them every day. So it's a lot they have to get through. Um, I, my dream is that I think, it, I think there's a place for it at, at a place like PBS. So all your friends at PBS, I would love to talk to you about it. I'd love to show you and tell you more about the show. Um, and that's, uh, that's where it's at. Well, I, I definitely agree. I've, I've had a chance to watch a few of the episodes. I've had a chance to show one of them to my students. Oh, um, thank you. My goal would be to, uh, but the problem is they're a little hard to get here in the United States. There yes, are. Can't get it. I know. It's very right. frustrating. Yeah, there are two episodes that you can watch on YouTube. So if anybody is watching or listening, you can go to youtube.com and, and look up. I think it's the CBC channel. And there are two full episodes that are there of the 52 or whatever it is. And you can get an idea of what it's like. And what I stood back from thinking was, number one, is how wonderful the cast is. Um, just the it's, it's inclusive. Kids can see themselves in it. That's awesome. And then I step back and I listen to the music and I just ask myself, how many hours did it take <laughs> to arrange, record, you know, do everything? And the, I guess the question I have is, are they always performing to a track that they're like, you know, like lip syncing to, or are they actually performing some of that live at the same time? They... The, the the live part is when I'm sitting with the kids and we're we're doing our sing song. Um, so what happens for anyone who hasn't seen it? And it is frustrating. They block it. So CBC puts them on on YouTube, but it's only in Canada. It's blocked, whatever they call that blocking thing. Um, so you guys can't see it. I'm sorry about that. Anyway, I would love that to just be unblocked, but we'll I'm working on it. So I sit with the kids and we learn a song. And then later, a few, a little while later, the kids have a few segments. It's a short show. And then they perform the show, the same song that we did as a sing song. So the kids at home are singing little parts. Like they might learn a little harmony note or they might learn what the words are. They're going to sing, oh, here's the chorus, la, 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 whatever it is. And then later the kids come back, our kids on the show come back and it's, it's a fancy version of the, of the song we learned. And it, that's when they are lip syncing and dancing and it's a produced version. So it's, it's very pop, pop music. Um, but it's those kids that did record, they, it's their voices recorded. They did all the recording and everything. Um, but earlier on, it's just live singing, very raw live, like real, real, real. I'm just live playing everything in one take. It's just like we did it for real Z's. <laughs> and then <laughs> later it's, it's, and that was important too, because I don't want kids. I mean, kids only see lip synced things. They don't know that they don't even know what an out of tune note so sounds like if, if someone's singing because nothing is recorded in the, in the old way. Like even the nuance of a, of a note going up into becoming a tuned note is part of some artistry for some singers, right? That's part of their art. We don't hear that so much anymore. You go, go back and listen to Whitney years ago and it's like, okay, I love when there's no auto tune and she's perfection. She's perfection, but I love being able to hear her work a note, which we don't hear in music anymore. Cause it's very, anyway, it's, it's, it's good too. I like, I like it. I like it now. I like it then, but I wanted to show both things in the show and I wanted them to hear just a person singing in a room live and that it's not perfect. It's not, it's, it's pretty good. I'm singing in tune. I'm, I'm a good singer, but it's not about that. It's about us having community together. Right. And then later they come back and do the song and it's fancier. So that's, that was the point of that. And, uh, uh, I'm really proud of even just the tunes we wrote. I'm, I was so careful about it. I just wanted it to be a really safe place, a beautiful place and, and lyrically, um, such an inclusive place. And, 
um, people are people are catching on to that, which I'm happy about. And positive message all the way through um, collaboration, just and people asking questions. I mean, I think there's an episode where um, one of the girls asks the girl in the wheelchair about the situation or, or something like that. And so yeah. it's like it's not pretending like there aren't, you know, deeper things. But at the same time, it's it's meant to be just fun and enjoyable and it gives kids a positive experience with music. So I, I'm all for it. And my, my students reacted very positively with the one episode I showed them because, again, we're, you don't have access to everything yet. you got to figure that one out. Um, but, yeah, I, I hope there's a, a second season and more to follow because it's it's neat. Oh, and also the set is kind of fun. It's a very basic set, but it's completely like, you know, like the, the parts move around just to create a whole new, and it, if anybody's done theater, that's what theater is really all about, is you have a set and you figure out how to make it multi-purpose. So one yeah. side, it's a giant ukulele, another way, it's another thing. And then you've got blocks and things. It's it's just really brilliant. And coming from some experience, that's just like that. But it, it's in almost all the, now I think there are some songs that repeat in some episodes, yeah. you know, but, but it's still an amazing amount of work. I just can't fathom the prep time that it took. I, I hope you were able to sleep during the recording of that process. It was Cause... it was a lot. I'll tell you, it was a lot. And my brother bore the brunt of of. I mean, he was the engineer and the and the producer of the tracks, and and um, you know, I did a lot of the recording and playing and and everything, and as did he. But he, we had once we got it all recorded, and I I sang all the songs as we were writing them and recording them, and then we had to audition, choose kids, bring them in and re-record all the vocals and get it ready for production, which was all, you know, oh, you've got two weeks or something insane. I mean, it was heavy duty, but um, he he was the one that bore the brunt of it. And he's he's such a pro. So I was just lucky to have him on the team. Were any of the kids from your own Doan U, Doan School program? One was. Uh, a, few, a few auditioned and one made it through to being on the show. His name is Quinton and he's uh, featured on in every episode. So, um, you know, we, we, we auditioned kids from all over Ontario because we were going to be shooting in Ontario and it was a pandemic and all the rest of it. But um, one of my students made it into the show. So that is pretty cool. That's cool too. Yeah. I just, I just, I think it's fantastic. So hopefully there's a season two. Hopefully we can get that on. I'm surprised that PBS hasn't picked it up already, to be honest with you. I think they haven't seen it. So, you know, let's go. Anyone who's, who's got a connection for me, I just feel like it hasn't happened. So I'm, I'm ready for that meeting. I, I think it is the right place for it. It's so, it's so, um, it's just it's just a safe place and and similar to CBC it's a safe place and it and it's not afraid of let's just have a like we can have a second where it's not like bombarding you every second of the day we're we're okay with it being like thoughtful for a moment you know and that's and not everyone is is able to do that on on a network i know it's not it's not always possible but there's some places where it is possible so how does CBC package that with their because you know americans we are so set on this 30 minute time frame you mm. know of a, of a show how do they package that in in this you know in canada with cbc with the six minute show what do they do the kids shows are very much that way sometimes they'll put um if you have a seven minute show you'll do three seven minutes in a row if they want to fill in that hole but but uh, if, if you look at i don't know if you go on to a pbs you can look at it on the schedule on your on your tv and it'll be a lot of small shows in a row it's okay. just i think that's the trend that uh, it's not particularly my expertise but I'm, I'm kind of in it now but that's what i see i don't think it's unusual in kids television is it awkward to watch yourself in the show at all? I've I've got over looking at myself a long time ago. <laughs> I see, I tend to be the one that's you go do it. Okay, all right, out I go. I tend to be the one out front uh, blazing the trail. So I'm I'm over it for that. It's it's but I, I'm I you know I I'm proud of it and I I don't have to look at every little hair on my head every second. Thank you very much, but. Um, you know, I was the one to do it and it, and it was appropriate. So that's okay. <laughs> no, it was great. It's, it's great. It's fantastic. And anybody watching just, you need to go check it out. 
because yeah, it's not how to play ukulele. It's it's how to celebrate music and and That's enjoy it. yeah, and like many family so, and friendship and community and and family and and just our our differences and and how we're really just the same. In the end, that's it. Now, you've been incredibly gracious with your time today, so I, I thank you for that. The last question I'm just going to ask you is, do you ever get asked by people to come and teach or perform at, like, ukulele festivals or anything like that? Not particularly. Um, I think I'm not in that uh, – I'm just not in that zone so much. I'm so focused on uh, being in school. I really think there are two different worlds here – which is fine, but there are there, there's a there's a world of the the ukulele enthusiasts who are are have the means to travel around and go to festivals and or they're nearby and that's part of their world and 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 they're they love to do that. Um, and then there's there's music teachers and that's really my zone of like that's what I grew up in music education. Uh, people who are interested in how can we how can we get this in the hands of more kids? That's where I'm coming from. I love to play and I love meeting people. So uh, recently we played in Nova Scotia at a, it's it's a it's a, they call it the ukulele Kaylee, which is a festival. And James came and my dad performed and we as a family my daughter came and my brother and his little daughter came and we did a little show with my dad, which was. A, you know, amazing. So that was uh, definitely um, more of a festival ukulele enthusiast kind of situation. And and we do, we do those sometimes, but um, in general, I'm very much entrenched in school, the schedule of being at school and um, you know, then sometimes working on a TV show or whatever else I might have on the go, but I, I don't tend to be in, in running in that circle. Not that I wouldn't want to. I just, it just is where it's at, I guess right now. And I guess final question, is there any other upcoming project that people should be looking for that's coming up? Or is, is that all secret, perhaps, with what's going on with Doan School and things? Well, um, at the at Doan Music School, we're always going to have something up our sleeves. So we're, we're doing collaborations all the time. And um, I really am just wanting to showcase the kids because they're such good players. But like my dad did... Um, to celebrate our program and to celebrate music and our musicianship, we can do that by creating a recording, uh, creating a performance. Um, and that's what he did for us. We would make records. He didn't say, let's, you know, we should have a bake sale because we want to go on a trip or we should, we should all wash cars. He'd say, we are musicians. We're going to have a concert and we're going to make records and everyone sells two records and we'll have enough money to go to the, you know, up to the Canadian exhibition in Toronto and we're going to play. Um, that's how we promoted the program at those times. And that's the same for us is our, our, our kids are so good. The proof is in the pudding. Who has kids in their program? We do. <laughs> Who's <laughs> keeping kids on board and wanting to come back year after year? We are. Why? Because it's that good. And they are so good. And so let's showcase them. And so we'll have something. Keep your eyes open. Come to the website or come follow on Instagram. It's fun. I can show lots there and you can see what we're doing. And of course, there's also a music available for purchase too. Like people can. Well, you can just get it free. Go to Spotify or Apple and you can put us on your ukulele playlist. I'd love you to add us to your plate. We've got so many beautiful songs and by our that we've collaborated with, Bare Naked Ladies, Jan Arden, but also some that are just featuring our students on their own, which are pretty great. So you can go check it out and put it. They're all going to be uplifting. They're all going to be ones that you want on your happy playlist. So please add us in. It helps the program a lot. Just to add our songs helps the program. It, you don't have to be a donor and come up with some kind of big check or something. Adding us to a playlist helps the program. So I thank anyone who feels like doing that. Be really great. Excellent. Well, thank you again so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for listening and watching. I hope you're having a great day. Don't forget to check out, I'll put it back up on the screen more time, www.donemusicschool.ca, as well as considering adding those recordings to your Spotify, Apple Music playlist, and so forth. We'll see, see you next time. time.